Hi everyone, my name is Joseph, I am a PhD student in Philip Asalo's lab at MIT, and I'm going to be discussing the platform that I've been building with Ray and RLib for the past few years. Neural MMO is designed to support a wide variety of directions in multi and many agent research, while being computationally accessible and fully open source. It features large agent populations, long time horizons, open-ended task structure, and reasonably complex game mechanics. We support up to 1,024 agents in up to 1,024 by 1,024 environments. If we zoom in on this little crop in the center and then zoom in on the crop in the bottom right, you can get a sense of the local scale, which you can think of as on the order of one square kilometer if you like. When I first started this project, reinforcement learning infrastructure was rather restrictive. It generally focused on single agents interacting with short fixed time horizon environments through flat, full, uh, flat fully observed state and flat actions. This wasn't the worst choice for environments of the time, such as those in the arcade learning environment, and even some more modern tasks of a similar style, such as those in Gym Retro and in the Procgen Suite. And it comes with some advantages, such as being able to represent states, actions, and rewards as flat tensor buffers, which makes it rather easy for individual researchers to re-implement training algorithms from project to project without having to rely on an external infrastructure. However, times have changed both in academia and in industry, and we now look at a much wider range of tasks that require more interesting infrastructure patterns. So these are some projects that have particularly inspired, inspired Neural MMO, including OpenAI5, which beats top players at Dota, AlphaStar, which is DeepMind's pro Deep project that beats top players at StarCraft, OpenAI's Emergent Tool Use project, which plays 3v3 hide and seek, and DeepMind's CTF work, which plays a Quake modded version of Capture the Flag. In order to support these environments, neural MMO, and things we'd like to build going forward, we need to consider large and variable agent populations interacting with long horizon and persistent environments via hierarchical, partially observed state and structured actions. From an infrastructure perspective, this creates a few additional challenges. So instead of having flat fixed state buffers, you now have agents that are being added in and removed periodically. So you end up with overlapping segments of individual agent episodes that do not fit in memory anymore. So you need to either batch these by subsetting, doing something like this, where you have each individual uh, episode uh, from the start, but then this still might not fit in memory if you have really long time horizons. And also this is a little bit difficult to batch efficiently. So practically you end up doing something more like this, where you crop or segment individual agent episodes midway through. And then this creates a new challenge because ideally you'd like to be learning across these, seg these segmentation boundaries uh, in order to avoid losing long-term dependency data. This is just one of the challenges though. We also have to deal with uh, complex observations and actions. So there tends to be this trade-off in environment design where you can have uh, complex actions, but then you have, to you have to justify and trade that off against having a computational efficiency as well as representation power in both the action and the observation spaces really. So a concrete example of this is in OpenAI 5, where really the core architecture is a simple one layer LSTM at the bottom left here. But in order to process the complex observation space and action space, you need to have a very complex set of subnetworks associated just to get the, the observation space into something that fits a flat vector to the input of an LSTM, and then can take the output of the LSTM from a flat vector into the action space shape. This is not unique to Dota. You get a similar thing in other large scale projects such as in AlphaStar where they've written it down a little bit differently but you still have a ton of different types of encoders, uh, MLPs, transformers, and resnets for scalar data, entity data, and spatial data. And then similarly on the outside, MLPs, attentional networks, and DCOMs for scalar, attentional, and spatial data. The core is still an LSTM. We had to design a similar sort of observation space to suit neural MMO, but we have a little bit more flexibility here because we're designing an environment from scratch rather than using an existing game, and we're designing specifically from the ground up for research. So we try to balance better efficiency along with simplicity and expressivity, and we do so using a fully uh, object-based observation space. So if you're an agent in neural MMO, you observe the set of agents around you, as well as the set of tiles around you. These are all objects that are represented by a set of discrete 
and continuous attributes. So if you observe another agent, you're really observing its health, its food, its level, etc. Now, in order to combine these into a uh, flat observation, it's a little bit tricky, but not as difficult as in the case of Dota or StarCraft. In general, something such as an attentional network that combines attributes into a single per object embedding, and then another layer of attention that, course, that combines the various different object embeddings into a single observation setting embedding will work just fine. This also has an additional advantage in terms of efficiency for this layout because we're actually able to maintain a serialized copy of all the observation data that you might want to query synchronously with the actual high-level game object description of the environment, which is in Python. And this allows us to compute observations simply by indexing into tensors, which is 50 to 100 times faster than the naive approach. And this enables us to keep everything in raw Python while still maintaining a fair bit of speed. So we get development flexibility as well as the efficiency. We do something similar on the action side where we have a move action and an attack action. Uh, we want to, in general, support lists of actions that take lists of arguments. So the degenerate case is just one move action in a particular direction. But we also have this attack action, which takes as an argument. It takes a style, melee range mage, and also it takes a target. And this target action is a little bit different in that uh, it's selected specifically from the observations. So you see a bunch of agents, you pick one of them to attack, you see different numbers of agents at different times, so this is variable length. And supporting this in infrastructure corresponding, uh, in addition to supporting corresponding difficult uh, complexities in the observation space, in addition to supporting trajectory segment batching in large agent populations, really that's quite a lot to support now. It really makes sense to be looking at dedicated infrastructure for that. And when I started this project a few years ago, none really existed. So I started trying to assemble, assemble things myself in base ray, working in parallel on the environment, the backend infrastructure, the training algorithms, and the models. But that was really too much to handle all at once, and there were lots of rooms for errors. So progress was somewhat slow, though we did get somewhere uh, in the initial stage of that work. But then there was a turning point about a year and a half ago where I noticed that RLlib had matured to the point that it was close to doing the things I wanted in Neural MMO, and I started porting things over. And I was able to get in contact with some of the developers, and uh, Sven and Eric in particular were very, very helpful in actually uh, porting over the additional features that I requested, as well as patching a few cr critical bugs. I put a couple pull requests together myself as well, but really they deserve the credit for this. And the result at the end of the day is that now an application that would have been very, very difficult a few years ago is now an out-of-the-box application of RLib. And this is quite exciting because now we can actually start investigating much more complex environments. So Neural MMO itself is inspired by the game genre of massively multiplayer online games. You might be more familiar with arcade tasks, which are short levels, short and level based in uh, RL research, or perhaps industry scale tasks, which tend to, in recent years to examine more team based and round based settings. MMOs do neither of these things. They just take hundreds to thousands of players, they drop them in a persistent simulated open world, they don't assign any fixed teams, agents are free to collaborate and compete however they like, form their own social structures, develop their own economies, they're free to come up with their own gameplay strategies, and really you get this sort of long-term extended socially relevant reasoning in MMOs that you don't see in other environments that we typically use for research. So we can't quite support all of this yet with the current infrastructure, but we're rather close. Uh, we do support some core elements of this already in Neural MMO. And in fact, I think at this point, the core difficulty is really just getting more people on the platform, developing for a variety of different research directions and proposing new open challenges for the community on the platform. In order to support a wide variety of work on Neural MMO, uh, we've developed the game using a set of modular game systems that can be individually enabled, disabled, and configured to study different aspects of research and behavior, of intelligence and behavior. So on the right, we have a resource system which adds food and water. Agents need to balance these in order to maintain their health. This is good for exploration type settings, as well as for analyzing population dynamics as they change over time, such as carrying capacity. In the middle, there's a conflict resolution system in the form of combat that's well suited to competitive and team-based research. And on the left, there is a scripted agent system where you can defeat these scripted agents. They drop armor. That is an upgrade for you, but there's a risk reward trade-off associated with trying to do so. And then combining all these various different mechanics together, there's a progression system on the bottom, and that allows agents to become better at things in the environment by doing them. 
So if you forage for resources a lot, you'll be able to hold more resources at a time and gather more from each tile. If you fight a lot, you'll do more damage, be more accurate, etc. And this introduces an element of long-term strategy because now you have to not just survive in the short term, but you also need to figure out what skills you should be working towards to give yourself a competitive advantage a thousand time steps later. We support procedural map generation in this domain as well. This is just known to support more robust and stable training as well as better generalization. We've reproduced this result in neural MMO as well. Typical usage of the platform is as follows. Users write a short configuration file that will define the game map size that they want to use as well as the game systems they want to enable. You can also, if you choose, make any overrides that you'd like such as customizing terrain gen or tweaking a particular game system. Now, by default, we provide you a reward of negative one for dying, zero for everything else. This is a very general use case, but you also have full access to define your own rewards using game state and agent state. So once you've defined your own tasks and your own configuration suited to your own research questions and applications, you'll define your policy and your optimization algorithm as normal. You have full, uh, full accessibility to RLib here, so you have your uh, default policies, you have default optimizers, but of course you can write your own in either case, RLib is going to do the back-end work of handling traje trajectory segment processing, object uh, observation and action serialization, and all these other technical components. So once you've trained, you're going to want to evaluate your policies. So you can pull these up in a renderer. You can see what your agents are doing. And since we've built this from scratch for research, we can also include research tools directly within the game client in the form of overlays for visualizing what it is that your agents have learned. So during training itself, we provide lots of different various metrics for interpreting agent behaviors. We'll tell you what's the average population, how long are agents surviving, are they foraging well, are they engaging in combat, are they fighting scripted NPCs, how much are they exploring, all these different metrics. You can add your own as well, but generally this is a, a good baseline for understanding what your agents are doing. A note here on efficiency, uh, this should be accessible to just about any academic lab. All of our experiments run on a single RTX 3080, so a single decent graphics card, and then 32 CPU cores for a few days. And actually, this is the environment is efficient enough that you can collect over 1 billion observations in this time, equal to over 19 years of real-time play, which is way more than you need in order to learn basic tasks. So once you've trained, you're going to want to evaluate your agents on unseen maps that have been held out from training. You can very quickly then see whether or not you've overfit by comparing to your training data. And then you can also compare to our various pre-trained and scripted baselines in order to see how your results stack up versus ours. Once you find a particular stat of interest that you want to get understand in more detail, we have a fully interactive and customizable dashboard. So on the second row here, for example, is population. You have access to the full distribution as well as how population changes over the course of evaluations, as well as the spread across different evaluations on different maps. You have access to similar data for all the stats we've predefined, and you can add your own stats into this plot, these uh, autogen plots very easily. I'd like to mention the graph on the top briefly. This is a nice highlighting of uh, the utility of the environment. So here's the training log. This is just all of those, uh, those stats that we've recorded during the course of training. And we've only trained agents to survive, but actually they've learned a progression of different skills. They've learned first to survive and forge, then they've actually learned to fight each other, and if you keep training for much longer, they actually learn how to specifically go and farm scripted NPCs for their equipment. So you get this nice progression of skills uh, through this high-level reward without really specifying that agents should be doing any of these things individually. We also want to help in interpretability. So what we've done here is we've provided a 2D overlay API that will render heat maps on top of the client. You can specify your own heat maps through our API, or you can use some of the ones that we've included by default. So on the top left, as an example here, we plot intensity proportional to exploration frequency. And this shows you how agents are generally exploring the map. On the bottom left, we plot the local value function. So we've taken the value function as agents are walking over tiles and just painted this as an intensity. And we've actually seen that agents have learned to avoid the edges of the map where they, they originally spawn and where there's a whole bunch of competition, there's lava, there, aren't, there, there are not that many resources. They try to get towards the center of the map, more resources, less competition, generally a better idea. You can do more complicated things as well. So on the top right, we've taken the magnitude of the embeddings corresponding to the tiles uh, in agent observations. And plotting those intent as intensities 
allows us to see what tiles agents are focusing on in their decision making. And we actually see that agents have learned to focus on barriers that are in their path, as well as resources that they might want to collect. You can do more complicated things as well as you begin factorizing the various parts of the internals of the network. So I won't get into too much detail on that, but one example on the bottom right is that we took the value function, uh, the portion of the value function only computed by looking at other agents, and we're able to see that agents have actually learned to be sensitive to the presence of higher level, stronger agents that are potentially a threat. These same, these same overlays work just as well, if not better, in larger maps. So here we can see the same exploration overlay, but now you see exploration learned over hundreds of time steps rather than a few dozen. And some overlays take on new meanings in larger settings. So this one is a skills overlay. Red corresponds to being better at combat. Blue corresponds to being better at forging. And actually we see that agents in high population densities towards the center of the map, they tend to focus on combat because there aren't enough resources to go around. Whereas agents that are able to get towards the less populated extremities of the environment are able to focus on a safer and more passive uh, foraging strategy. And you get a mix of the two in the center. These results were achieved with just simple negative one reward for dying, but we do want to give users a, a sense of what other rewards they could use. So we've been working on this achievement system here. The idea being to not to provide too sparse of a reward, but also not too hand engineered of a reward. So we standardize on something that looks similar to the gameplay milestone systems uh, that you see in many modern games where maybe we'll reward agents for defeating their first player, or maybe we'll reward them for getting their first piece of medium level equipment or for getting all the way across the map for the first time. And we haven't even, we haven't really seen a concrete advantage to doing this versus training on just lifetime so far, but I do think that this is going to be important in the future for interpretability because it's possible to have a policy that's not all that interesting, but survives very well. But really, if you're achieving a high score according to this metric, well, we've defined the points of that system according to things that we think are high level interesting goals. So it, you're sort of guaranteed to have an interesting policy if you get a high score in this metric. A final note here on the development cycle. Uh, one really nice thing about taking inspiration from an existing game genre is that we can just port mechanics from existing games wholesale and hopefully they will introduce the same sort of complexities into gameplay for our agents as they do for human players. So one thing we're looking at in the upcoming future is to add in a bigger item system with an exchange system so that agents can actually specialize in gathering a particular resource or in a particular type of combat. They can get items from that. They can sell the excess items that they don't need to other players, and they can use the proceeds to buy things that they do need but can't get themselves from agents with a different specialty. This is one of those places where more infrastructure would help a little bit, because one thing we'd like to do is link all of the different exchange markets across all the different training and evaluation servers so that you have one massive market and sort of instead of a bunch of small fragmented ones. In the nearer term, though, we're looking at putting together a competition build of the environment. So whoever would like, whoever uh, would like to is able to submit different policies to our evaluation server, and then we will evaluate them on a number of different tasks. And we're going to be looking at mainly things such as robustness to unseen opponents, as well as ability to work together in small teams of other agents. So if you're interested in hearing more about this or other aspects of the platform, we have a Twitter here. Uh, this is where I post major updates for the platform as well as other news in the field. I have a documentation page here that has tutorials, quick start guides, installation instructions, uh, as well as the full documentation and additional uh, papers and releases related to the platform. And then finally, on the bottom right, there is a Discord link, which is also linked on the documentation page. And this is where you can get support if you're a user, you can have a discussion with the community, you can get more frequent development updates, and if you miss the live Q&A, this, this is also the place to go. Thank you very much.